Hey everyone, thanks for joining. Today I'm speaking with Jeff Greenslake. Jeff is a professor of physics at San Francisco State, and he's also on their academic freedom committee. Hi Jeff, thank you for coming on. Thank you, uh, thank you for having me. So yeah, as I mentioned, you're a professor of physics at San Francisco State, but I want to talk to you a bit about the academic freedom committee first, because this is something I'm kind of harping on about since about 2014. <laughs> you witnessed the professor um, who was teaching a history of the Islamic world class, showing a picture of Muhammad, or I think it's a picture of an art piece of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Muhammad. And you were also there for when Riley Gaines came to speak. Um, well, I wasn't physically there, uh, but, uh, but of course I knew about it. Okay, right, sorry, I didn't, uh, but you were there. I'm still trying to understand the reasoning of the college in the first instance, because sure. I mean, that, goes directly with like the administration yeah well mm -hmm. so if it was an islamic history class or a history of like it was a history of islamic art or or history of the islamic world and he's showing an actual art piece painted by a muslim that's part of like you know part of the islamic world like i don't understand how the how the university can say that there's something wrong with that. yeah well okay first of all this was outrageous uh, especially since there's such a similar case happened before in Hamline University, which caused mm -hmm. universal outrage. What's going on here is this. Uh, there are basically two ways of suppressing speech at San Francisco State, and I think at most other universities. One of them is called the bias response teams. Ours is called the bias incident uh, education team. You know, if you say something, you're going to be educated. Um, so that's one of them. They don't have actual punitive power, but, you know, they can pull you in and tell you what a bad thing you did. The other one, which is more serious, actually, is the so-called DHR or discrimination, harassment, retaliation section of Title IX. Now, these guys have a lot of power. The way it works is that if somebody, a student, let's say, hears something they don't like, they can denounce you to this uh, DHR office. And the DHR office can pull you in. And that begins a year long investigation with uh, all kinds of legal threats. You know, you can be terminated. Uh, and <laughs> they say it doesn't stop with that, up to and beyond termination. So uh, who is who's on this? There, there are um, campus administrators. Basically, it's just campus administrators, usually with doctorates from in education for some reason. And these guys are the the judge and the jury. So a case comes to them, and they it's up to them to decide whether they're going to prosecute it or not. Once they decide to, it's out of the hands of even the president of the university. We have this president, Lynn Mahoney, whose heart is probably in the right place. When this thing started, uh, FIRE, uh, you know what FIRE is, of course, yeah. uh, protested. We in the Academic Senate protest, uh, Academic Freedom Committee protested because this was one of our members. Uh, then, you know, the union protested, various Muslim groups protested. They said, well, there's nothing wrong with showing a picture of the Prophet Muhammad. There's nothing at all. The fact is this student was uh, is a member of uh, a very extreme version of uh, Islam, which is found in Saudi Arabia somewhere. And when this professor showed a picture of the Prophet Muhammad, in the context of a class in early Islamic history, uh, this guy got very angry. He protested to the professor. The professor said, look, I mean, this is the way I teach the course. This is part of the history. Then he protested to the, um, the chair who said, well, you know, sometimes education involves seeing some uncomfortable things. Then he went to this Title IX office that I just uh, mentioned, the discrimination, blah, blah. Title IX used to have to do with, um, with sexual misconduct. But as I said, they broadened it now to speech, and they treat speech basically on, on a par with, uh, with date rape. So he went to them, and he uh, explained to them how, you know, 
uh, terribly hurt he had been and how unsafe he feels. And now he wants the professor to, in the most humiliating way, apologize to the whole class for the terrible thing he had done. Okay, well, these Title IX administrators took it on. And uh, this, this did go on for about a year, despite protests from everybody, from fire, from our committee, from Muslim groups, and so on. And one of the things, I was, I was involved in this, so I, I got a chance to see the process up hand, the, the process uh, firsthand. By the way, the, the president, she said, when she was contacted by fire and by us, well, there's nothing I can do. And the fact was, she was right. There was nothing she could do. This office operates independently, and when, once they've got their clutches on you, there's nothing anybody can do to stop it. Okay, so how does this work? Well, what happens is that the offender, this professor, gets dragged in front of a tribunal. Now, the, uh, the offender is allowed to take two people with him. One is an advisor and one is a support person. Well, the support person isn't allowed to speak, so it's not clear why he's there. I mean, you might as well bring a teddy bear. It's just, it's just crazy. Um, but I was there, and I was prepared because I had uh, read the... Um, there's a, the California State University system has a very clear definition of what constitutes harassment, which he was being charged with. And it was clear at a glance. You just have to read it for 30 seconds. You can see that what he did, showing a picture of the Prophet Muhammad, was nothing close to harassment. It was nowhere near this. So my idea was to come in, this was a Zoom meeting, and simply, you know, point this out and say, drop the case. There's no case here at all. Well, that's not the way it happened. The first thing that happened, as I said, this was a tribunal. And there's a, the, the grand inquisitor uh, who's, who's running the meeting. And the first thing she says is that it's a Zoom meeting. She did not agree. To, this was not going to be recorded, and she didn't agree to being recorded. Well, of course, that's uh, right there. That's a red flag, isn't it? Why don't you, <laughs> you know, if this is some kind of legal proceeding, why, why are you objecting to being recorded? So then I tried to say, okay, I, I have some questions, some things to raise. No, I couldn't raise it. Could I share my screen? I wanted to show these uh, these rules. No, I couldn't share my screen. Everything I tried to say, and of course, what Maziar tried to say, was put down. No, it, we could only ask questions about procedure. Finally, I got my, my say. I said, look, okay, I'm going to ask a question. Uh, can you really prosecute this given that the rules are this, that, and that, and that? She ignored it. So the whole thing was completely outrageous. It was like, uh, it was like going in front of the secret police, basically. So when it was over, um, myself and the other fellow, uh, his name was Trevor from the history department. Trevor wrote a very strongly worded uh, letter to the president, and I did also. And what she managed to do was to take this case out of the local San Francisco state office and move it to the Long Beach office. That's where that's the, uh, the center of the California State University system. And I thought that was the end of it, because after all, this was simply embarrassing. But it wasn't. Uh, they, they did eventually clear the guy of harassment, but not before they accused him of unprofessional conduct, which they were referring to the Faculty Affairs Office. Well, that went nowhere. I mean, of course, it was dropped. But the point is, the idea that they accused him of unprofessional conduct, according to what standard, gives you a pretty good idea of the kind of people who are hired to enforce this DHR policy. And this wasn't the only case. I mean, the only reason I know about these is because I'm a member of the Academic Freedom Committee. And two of our members were subjected to this. One was the, uh, the case that everybody knows about, this uh, Maz Maziar um, and the, the Prophet Muhammad. 
Another, it was a um, professor of uh, Pacific Island studies or something. And on a Zoom meeting, apparently he addressed a transgender student by the wrong pronoun. The student, again, denounced him to the, uh, this, uh, this office, which again initiated a um, nine-month investigation. It was eventually dropped because, of course, it's idiotic. But even so, this causes a whole lot of stress. You know, again, you're being threatened that you might be terminated. It's the process that's the punishment. Right? It's the, it's where the process itself is a punishment. That's right. right. And, and, and okay, the way you're describing it, you said, you know, it's kind of like the secret police, but if even the president of the university does not have any authority over it, at that point, it's an inquisition. It's not, there, there's no, there's no checks and balances. There's no, there's no one watching over it there's no like i don't even know what the appeal process is see like this is where these individual cases are bad i mean like I, you know they're ridiculous and just i don't want to get into the specific ind individual cases for my whole thing on this is you know now i'm going to start sounding like someone you know who's who's like the anti-racist camp there is a problem systemically everyone thinks with this intersectional lens everyone at you know in the administration at a certain level like you know, the people who plan the meetings and the people who, you know, like the middle management types, they all have this lens. And in certain departments like HR or whatever, it could be from top to bottom. I don't know, but it's just, mm -hmm. you know, so. And that's now crept out into the general population, into other institutions. Okay, I'll give you an example. The I don't know if you paid attention or if you noticed or whatever. It's Canada, and I don't blame you if you didn't. Um, on Wednesday, they had this thing called the Million March for Children. Mm -hmm. And basically, all across the country, schools have the right to transition children without telling the parents or socially transition children. And the parents. Yeah, trans like, uh, sorry, transition them to what? Like, you know, like become transgender. Oh, we're talking about transgender stuff. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. So the, the kids, and so the parents were protesting this they're like no we want to know what's going on with our children like this is mm -hmm. you know, how, how can you do this mm -hmm. um 130 trade unions launched a meeting a couple of days before this protest that spurred on a whole bunch of other unions and then school boards and then governments from federal provincial and municipal levels were basically calling these parents who represent roughly about Two thirds, maybe a little bit more, of Canadians who feel the exact same way, mm. and they're saying we want to know what's happening with our kids, like including our prime minister. Like they were all called fascists mm. and far right, mm. and you know, my thing is okay. This is happening in the academy. That's like ridiculous, and you know, I go protest it, you know, up and down, but. The ripple on effect of what came out of the academy starting in about 2012, 2013, that was going out to the general population. Mm -hmm. Those institutions are so corrupt. You've got trade unions and labor unions calling parents, you know, fascist and right wing for being concerned about what's going on with your kids. And like I said, you've got our, from our prime minister all the way down, you've got politicians saying this. Yeah, and well, that's it. Oh. You know, so I, I explain that that's what I'm concerned about rippling yeah. out from the university mm -hmm. things like what you're talking about oh sure I mean again from San Francisco State we we had our own uh, transgender incident a um, uh, a woman athlete from some right-wing organization I forget what uh, came to uh, give a talk about the um, uh, she was arguing that um, transgender women shouldn't compete biologically with, shouldn't compete with biological women. And, you know, I, I don't have strong opinions about that, but you can certainly see her point, right? There's a reason that we separate men and women's sports. I'm not going to get into it because, again, yeah. I don't have strong opinions about it. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a position you could take. Well... <laughs> 
And she uh, she gave this talk in some classroom. There was the normal yelling and screaming, which I don't care much about because that's normal. Uh, you're you're allowed to you know dissent. You're allowed to express as long as you let the speaker speak. So apparently she was able to speak and she gave her talk. But then after the talk, she was chased into a room. And nobody seems to dispute this. She ended up in a locked room guarded by campus police, and she was in there for hours before the um, uh, city police came, and then, then she was escorted out. But, you know, this was, to me, pretty outrageous. I mean, you know, she was physically intimidated. As far as I can tell, that's, that's undeniable. So this is an example of what you're talking about. Uh, this was then by, I think, the union characterized as hate speech. Well, it's not hate speech. I mean, it may be speech that you seriously dislike. You, you may be a transgender supporter, activist, whatever, and you may very much disagree with something like this. But the point is she was committing heresy. And that's basically what's going on now you know in the middle ages uh in the middle ages you could suppress free speech the free speech back then was called heresy if you were in some and, and they had very good reasons you know after all uh, if you were a heretic you were misleading people you could go you know you could send people to hell because of that so for that reason they burned heretics but we have something along those lines now as you say, there's a kind of a new religion. I think uh, John McWhorter makes that point uh, very clearly. It's a kind of a new religion. And they do not tolerate dissent of any sort. So if you dissent, you're going to, uh, you're going to get in trouble. You're going to get in trouble with your colleagues, with administrators. And if a student complains about your speech, generally because your speech contradicts some part of the initiative of the official doctrine if it's heresy of some kind then you can be dragged in front of this uh inquisition which is what this dhr office basically is so yeah that is the problem and i was thinking i, I think you're in canada right yeah there was a, there was a case some years back i forget the name of the university there was a young graduate student teaching assistant. And what she did was she showed a, uh, a video of a guy named Jordan Peterson. You probably yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that was uh, Loria University. And what was her name? That was... Uh, that's it. That's it. I forget uh, her uh, name now. Um, yeah, same here. Yeah, but anyway, she, she showed... So you know the story, but she showed this uh, video... Uh, and this fellow Jordan Peterson is a conservative guy, but okay, you know, he's an intellectual. So she showed the video without herself denouncing the content. And then she gets dragged in front of one of these bias response teams who, you know, grill mm -hmm. her on this and try to make her realize what a terrible thing she did because her crime was showing the video without telling the students how bad it was, without herself denouncing the content. She showed it to start a discussion. You know, it was a communications class. So she shows the video and, okay, let's discuss it. Well, apparently someone not even in her class was the one who denounced her. And so she got in. She had the presence of, of, of mind to record what happened, and that's available on YouTube if you look for it. Yeah, um, I just remember her name is Lindsay Shepard. But one thing that always struck out to me because I heard the whole recording of the, what she like her whole recording that she released. And there was at one point, one of the, one of the inquisitors, um, uh, his, his exact wording was about the video. He's like, Oh, don't you understand the problematic positionality of like, putting that video? And I was like, the problematic positionality, like what language are you speaking? It's, it's yeah, yeah, like, yeah. All it's jargon. Yeah, the, the, the guy was speaking the, the jargon of, um, what shall I call it? They call themselves anti-racist or social yeah. justice or something. But anyway, yeah. there's, a certain, there's a certain lingo. Yeah. The point but, is that uh, people who are against free speech have always had good reasons to be against free speech. 
again, in the Middle Ages, it was heresy. In the communist countries, it was uh, counter-revolutionary thought. In the 1950s, in the United States, it was un-American activities. There's always some good reason, and now they have some good reason. So they had some good reason to prosecute this, um, this graduate student. But one thing that struck me, you know, this free speech issue goes all the way back. I mean, you can go back to Socrates. What did they get Socrates mm -hmm. on? Well, he was misleading the youth of Athens. Well, Lindsay Shepard was doing the same thing, you see. That was her crime. It's exactly, the, you know, this is 2,500 years ago to Socrates and maybe five years back to Lindsay Shepard. It's the same thing, really the same thing. Yeah. Um, I kind of pointed something out in the other direction, which was because uh, it was right around the time when all these things were coming out saying, you know, White supremacy culture is professionalism and punctuality and love of the written word, you know, just, just utter nonsense. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, like, and free speech, it's a right wing uh, talking point and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and free speech is white supremacy and stuff. So I took a quote from this Arab. Uh, I shouldn't call him an Arab. He was a Muslim. He uh, wrote during the quote unquote golden age of Islam. His mm -hmm. name was uh, uh, Al Haytam. What was his name? Al Haytam, uh -huh. um, and he goes on this. It's just a little short thing. I, I can't remember it off the top of my head. But he's like, he's like, if you're, you know, if you're a seeker for the truth, you have to go back and read the books of the ancient and like critique them with every, you know, ounce of your ability. Like you have to, you, know, you have to read them as best as you can, mm -hmm. and don't just take them at their word. Mm -hmm. And and the wording of that and the phrasing of that that I just took the other John Stuart Mill, like, you know, he that only knows his side of the argument knows little of that. And then like you know, and talks about going on and learning it from the, learning the other side from the experts, you know, and like that. so and on all that. And I was just like saying, look at this comparison. This is from like a little over a thousand years ago, and this is from, you know, a few hundred years ago. And they're saying the exact same thing. It's, it's you know, mm -hmm. it's the same argument that was being made. It's just you know, but it, like now it's being called white supremacy. It's just like like that, it's a, you know, I, I'm going to be cliched here, but it is that Orwellian thing now. It's like what's going on there, then what's trickling down. Like, you know, it is Orwellian. You're getting history sort of rewritten. Like, if you look at high school kids now, I think the last thing I saw was like just a little over half didn't think communism, like, weren't taught anything about communism or what it was or like how bad it was. Um, there was also something close to that number that weren't quite aware of the like the the extent of the Nazi regime and the Holocaust, they didn't fully grasp that. Mm -hmm. um, so you're having like <clears throat> by controlling this speech, by controlling that like what gets out, you know, you're, you're controlling that history. You've got ignorant kids who don't really know what happened in the past, and then you then you have them chasing a female athlete into a room, locking her up, or then you have a, a law class, you know. Um, shaming like a law professor and i think uh, at one point and there was a hundred or so law students standing in the hallway as she or as the professor was walking to the office like, like to their office to get something mm -hmm. it's like yeah, that's to do like walk a gauntlet and stuff I mean, yeah it's you know it's for me it's like it's these one on the like, these are your future lawyers yeah, yeah, yeah defending the first yeah. amendment yeah it's kind of amazing how how often this has to do with law students. I mean, uh, I think that the one, maybe the incident you're referring to was the one in Stanford, where yeah. uh, some group invited a, a federal judge, a right wing federal judge, but okay, but a federal judge to talk to them about something. And then exactly what you say happened. They refused to let him speak, the law student, you know, the other law students. And then there was uh, supposed to be a grown up in the room, one of the law professors. And she simply sided with the students until I told this guy what the, how awful he was. He didn't get a chance to speak. So that was one law incident. There was another law incident where, um, what was it? Yeah, uh, there was some law professor who was um, writing yeah, on an exam. He had written some hypothetical case. And in this hypothetical case, one person had said to another person, 
and then it included an N dash 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 dash. You can imagine what the N stands for. And there was also a B dash dash dash. So this was, you know, not the N word itself. It was like we use the N word. It's it's uh, stands in for something. But some black students took this guy to task. I mean, they they went and complained about it, and he was suspended just for that. Uh, yeah. So there's a lot of that going on. And again, I was jo- uh, yeah, I was, I was uh, joking about that a little while ago with someone. A couple of years ago, I was joking. I said, "Watch in a little while, they're going to say the N word. It's what, using the term the N word itself is racist because you can use it in a bad connotation. So people are just going to start saying N." And so this guy just got in trouble for like having N with a bunch of asterisks or hashes. Yeah, there's another case. I think uh, McWhorter talked about it. Uh, a mm-hmm. professor in a communications class was discussing um, with his class uh, these kind of pauses we use in in in, in conversation, mm-hmm. like the word you know or um or things things like that. And he said, well, in Chinese, they have the same thing. And then, uh, you know, the story, it was, uh, the word was, uh, I hesitate even here to say it. Uh, I'll say it. Uh, the word was nega. Yeah. Which means that. So that, that, it's the kind of, their, their, um. so some Chinese students, no, not Chinese, some black students in the class denounced him to the administration and he was suspended for that. You know, obviously he wasn't using the N word. He was using a Chinese word. But, you know, it, it 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 goes beyond ludicrous. And oh. your point about history is very true. I mean, you mentioned some medieval Arab scholar, and there yeah. was this period in, uh, as you say, the golden age of Islam, where uh, a lot of Islam, a number of Islamic uh, thinkers were very, very advanced for their time in in uh, in in advocating freedom of speech and and free expression and so on unfortunately a little bit later of course they clamped down yeah okay but see there is people always talk about that and i'm not going to argue with that because there there are and i've read some of them and i can you know i could talk with them but there was also another side so there was um um al-ghazali so al-ghazali was around about 1050 then he wrote this book um, the incoherencies of the philosophers. Mm-hmm. And it was basically an attack on advancing education. It's like saying, we know enough mathematics, we don't need to know anymore. He was a Sufi, so the, the, whole, the core belief of the Sufi is study everything and do everything in the name and glory of Islam and Allah. Okay, so that, that's the core of Sufism. Right now it's turned into foreign mysticism and stuff, but this guy was hardcore. He was given the title Proof of Islam. They said about his writings that if he lost the Quran and the Hadith, he could almost rebuild the entirety of Islam just with both of all his writings. Like he was he was very, very well respected. Um, so he wrote that you don't need any more mathematics. We have enough, we know enough, we can build these, you know, great buildings and you, you know, you had all the architecture going this. We don't need any more. We don't need any more philosophy. We have enough. Now we should take the mathematics and the philosophy we have. And use that to glorify Islam and Allah. So he was going back to that Sufi tent. So he, because he had the year of the Caliph, his vision took hold. And then you had the Mongols come in and sack Baghdad, and all the knowledge went. And then, I mean, Europeans took it, the Chinese took it, Indians took part of it. You know, it it, it scattered, but it never remained in the you know the Muslim world. And because Al Azali's thinking kind of it solidified just before the Mongols came in. When the Mongols receded, they never went back to look for that knowledge. Hmm. Like it was there. It was being hmm. used by it was being used by the Europeans. Right? And um but on the other side of it, Al Ghazali's writings as well went back to the Europeans. Now Al Ghazali liked the writings of Augustine and he wanted to kind of make himself out to be an Augustine of Islam. And then his writings made it up, and Aquinas liked them, and they became part of um, the rules for heresy and burning witches and you know, the Inquisition use some. So the Arab had two influences. The Golden Age of Islam had two influences, and it wasn't just Al-Ghazali. It was him and his students and people who thought like him that went up one side. And then you had uh, you know, 
Averroes and Avicenna and Ibn Khaldun and Al-Farabi and these people, and that writing went up, and that you know, led to the Enlightenment. So they, they or helped lead to the Enlightenment. It wasn't the only thing. So you yeah. had these two two things from Islam as well. Like you just didn't have oh, it was all wonderful and good because you had other thought as well that came out, and these people were also very well respected. And you know, so like I said, it, it, it was there was two uh, two sides of that. Oh, that's fascinating. I, I didn't know that. I knew, of course, that Arab thought, uh, who also, you know, had preserved Greek thought, and that yeah. was eventually transmitted through, I think, through um, through Spain, as, as far as I understand, uh, yeah. to, to the West. So that, that is fascinating that there, were, that there were these two two tendencies. I never heard of this guy you just mentioned, um, but that that's very interesting. But isn't it a little bit like that also in in the advanced West? I mean, we yeah. we have the we have these two these two currents. I mean, there's a current which is people like John Stuart Mill and so on mm -hmm. on liberty and you know free expression and freedom of thought and so on and so on and so on. It led to, I don't want to say Marx, because, you know, Marx was an economist and he was a revolutionary thinker and so on and so on, but it led to an extremely intolerant strain of this, where, you know, the workers' paradise became a kind of a dystopia where you couldn't, uh, you couldn't dare to disagree with, with the regime. So that also, I mean, it's like we have this very advanced civilization one part goes towards the enlightenment which by the way the enlightenment is one of the things that anti-racist social justice really hate and the other part led towards these uh these horrible regimes so it's it's interesting that uh, that a very creative civilization can develop two terrible strains yeah um i never thought of about it like that and no, it's because yeah, there is, and I, I mean, I, I've used the term "okay, attack on Western civilization," but you know, there is that side that communism is also Western civilization. It's you know, it's like it's it's an attack on a certain type of Western civilization. If you want to, you mm -hmm. know, like, you're gonna go like that, but yeah. Um, I just wanted to get back to one thing because I mentioned you're a professor of physics, so. I've been saying this for a while, and then there's a couple of things that happened in Canada, actually in Montreal, where I am. Um, but, you know, I said, an English professor, a history professor, a sociology professor, or a gender studies professor, any one of these people is not going to come up to the physics department and say, you're doing physics wrong. Like, you know, you just, <laughs> you, I mean, you, you'd laugh at them, right? Yeah. But if someone has... Um, a gender studies PhD or something like that, or, or, and they're coming through the administration and saying, okay, there's a problem with uh, gender disparity, and this is how it's going to have to be solved. At that point, the department has to defer, and you kind of have to defer because of the credentials. Okay, so what's happened in Montreal? So my alma mater, Concordia, uh, their physics department, someone put out a paper about white light being racist. The other big university, English university in Montreal, uh, Gill, uh, I spoke to his professor there. He's a chemistry professor. He was put out a grant for research. Um, uh, like uh, He wanted to do a study, a research grant. When it came to the section of how he was going to hire, he was using merit instead of some diversity structure. I don't know. And uh, he was denied because of that, because he wasn't being using it. He wasn't basing his hiring on diversity. Basically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, like, how does that square with STEM? Because, I'm uh, sorry, uh, you know, women can do physics. Uh, there, there's a few, I mean, uh, try, I, I can see their names in front of my head, but I just can't like, you know, recall it. But, like, there's, there's several that I've you know, read and seen. Um, but it, if you push to have just women or, like, X number of women, you don't have a pool large enough to maybe fill that. Yeah, it's called a pool problem. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I, I mean, basically, the, what you're touching on is is a couple of things. 
first of all, uh, some people will say, well, you're in STEM. Okay, now what's racist about physics? Nothing. I mean, it, it's, and physics is the same in Mongolia and Africa and Antarctica. It doesn't really depend on ideology or anything like that. And people have done great physics in communist countries and in the West and everywhere. It doesn't really depend on ideology. But what, what we're getting to now, right now, is that these people you've mentioned from gender studies and ethnic studies and whatnot um, have gotten themselves into the hiring process so we now have what's called a requirement for hiring of DEI statements, diversity, equity, inclusion. And DEI statements boil down to a, a loyalty oath. It's very much like a loyalty oath of the 1950s. So in order to be hired, you have to write some statement which uh, will say how you are going to advance the cause of diversity, equity, blah, blah. And there are you know, you can find them on the web. There there are uh, criteria for grading such statements. And if somebody would say, I will treat people according to the content of their character rather than the color of their skin, that's an immediate, you don't hire such a person. Right? Yeah. It's, it's just not allowed. And not just hiring. It goes beyond that. Uh, many places are imposing such criteria also for retention, also for getting tenure. And in my own field, physics, uh, the Department of Energy has made as a requirement when you apply for a grant that you have a peer plan. I forget what peer involved. I forget what the what, what the letters stand for. But what it boils down to is you have to explain how you are going to include minority students and so on in, in your research. But you might not have any minority students. There are not that many in STEM for whatever reason. So well, uh, okay, it just uh, it just maybe I want to push back on that one. Mm -hmm. I would think you'd have at least some South and East Asians. I mean, this physics what? is mathematics. South and East Asian students. I mean, physics is mathematics based, and South and East Asians do well in mathematics. So I'm just wondering if you at least have some, you know, like a pool of like Asians to to, to pick from. Oh yeah. Sure. I mean, uh, at the moment, my students are what? One of them is from India. One of them is a Moroccan. And one of them is Chinese. So, you know, but, but those guys are not counted. <laughs> okay, they're not counted. They're not the right mind. They, they, their skin color may be brown, but it's not the right brown. Or, it's, you know, it's not quite... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's... Fitting. So that's not what they... That's not... They, they don't count Asians. Uh, anymore. Asians are, what's the word, white adjacent. So Asians yeah. aren't counted. Okay. But of course, the whole thing is absurd, right? I mean, obviously, if you're, uh, this is the modern age, right? I mean, we want to have black students. If there's a black student who wants to work with me, wonderful. Come, please. Same with women, same with anybody. I mean, you don't discriminate against people. And in fact, yeah. you're very happy to have these diverse people. But, but again, the, the, the lack of diversity is interpreted by these people you mentioned, gender studies and whatnot, as evidence of white supremacy. That the reason there aren't these, these people there is because of white supremacy. Well, the reason that we don't have, for example, many black professors in physics is because we don't have that many postdoctoral black black people. And, and the reason for that is there's not that many graduate students. And the reason for that, okay, that gets into a long history, right? Which we don't want to yeah. get into. It's, uh, there are historical reasons for all of these things, of course. But to say that the university, not not you know, 100, 100 years of racism or something, but to say that the university right now is racist because we have these disparities, say, in the uh, in, in the racial composition of the professors in STEM, that, I think, is absurd. Yeah. But it's, it's treated as a fact, a plain fact. There's racial, you know, it's a white supremacist university because you can point to these disparities in racial composition of faculty. And I just think that's terribly unfair. Okay, we'll get to that in one sec. But the the DEI statements you're talking about, I call them professions of faith. 
it has a very Protestant and Calvinist feel towards it, but some of the things it has in it are also, you know, it remind me of Islam. Uh, mm-hmm. but the, the way you were describing the heresy, there's a thing on Islam called called fitna, which is spreading corruption in the land. And so the way you were describing, like, oh, you know, so that that's, that is, so I guess there's that. But the physics thing, where this may be or not. So in 2016 in Johannesburg, I believe it was the University of Johannesburg, but it was one of the universities. It was the philosophy department and the science department. They were having a two hour or so long meeting. Science must fall. Science must fall. <laughs> so, yeah. so at one point, I mean, they spent the first, I guess, about 20, 30 minutes setting up the rules for microaggressions and things like this. And this is in South Africa in 2016. They're already talking about microaggressions mm-hmm. and they're talking about privilege and all this stuff. So this language had already made it there. Um, and so these meetings went, uh, okay, but at one point in this meeting, the one of the philosophy departments talked about how they had uh, uh, witch doctors and could call down lightning upon their enemies. And someone in the science department snickered, and then they were made to apologize because that was a microaggression, and it was yeah, yeah. it was the end of the world. Um, yeah. Fast forward to 2020. Like I said that was 2016, uh, 2020, I believe it was 2021. Um, black physics. So part of it, the the innocuous part that they kind of like you know, they kind of hide behind was. Oh no, we just want more black physics professors. But then when you read into it, it's we want physics from a black perspective. It's taught through a you know white lens. We need to look at it from other angles. And maybe it's not, it doesn't have to be a jet objective and and you know, like it's it's just it, it's just putting that intersectional lens on physics. And the way yeah, I, so I, I look, kind of go ahead, sorry. Yeah, as a physicist, I have to say that's idiotic. But uh, yeah. this this has this has a, a history to it. Uh, it probably goes back to postmodernism and and uh, stuff like that. I'm not an expert on that, but oh. I do know that um, th- there's a long history th- with these guys with skepticism to science. In fact, at some point in the '90s, it was getting to the point where it was skepticism of objective reality, or at least science's claim to know anything about objective reality. We were just another. Uh, aspect of Western culture, which played by our own games, and there was nothing any more true about quantum mechanics than about some creation myth of some, you know, pre-industrial tribe. Mm-hmm. Well, of course, to a physicist, this is insanity. Okay, we we definitely believe yep. that there's an objective reality out there, and the reason we believe it, of course, is that it works. All these critics, they 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 have their cell phones and use their GPS and get on the airplanes, which they trust will work. And the reason they work is because there is an objective reality, which we've been kind of approaching for, you know, hundreds of years by following certain rules. When they call it white science, of course, it's not. It has nothing to do with being white. If there are people on the, some planet around Alpha Centauri, if they're physicists, they're going to come up with the very same rules that we do. It's got nothing to do with culture. And yet, to these groups, everything is culture. Everything has to do with culture. So uh, there must be a black perspective on science. Now, this is absurd. I know really a few absolutely top-rate black physicists and I can guarantee you that the way they do physics is exactly the same way that the rest of us do physics. There's, there's no black perspective on science. It's, it's just absurd. There's a yeah, human be- perspective on science. There is, uh, there, there, there is, it's got nothing to do with your skin color or your politics or anything else. There are wonderful physicists who are quite right wing and have ideas quite different from mine. There are great physicists who live in, who used to live in communist countries and maybe believe that. I mean, you have all sorts of perspectives, but they do all do physics. If they're good physicists, they all do it the same way. I mean, just step away from physics for a second. I mean, you have Francis uh, Foster, who headed the uh, Human Genome Project, and yet, you know, he saw a frozen waterfall that was frozen in three, in three, then he fell to his knees and gave himself to Christ because he believed in Trinity. I mean, like I said, he re- he led the Human Genome Project, and he was you know believed in Christ's resurrection. Talked about that. He was quite I mean, so. Yeah, you can have 
like I don't care if a biologist is a believing Christian, even if he's a, you know, a young earth creationist uh, believes in the talking snake, but he can go into a biology classroom and teach the biology. I don't care what his personal beliefs are. I really don't. It shouldn't matter at all. Of course. Uh, but okay, I highly doubt there's a young Earth creationist who could teach a biology course and be realistic at the same point. Um, you know, but like I said, I, I don't think. But, you know, again, I maybe I'm pessimistic. Maybe I'm just being only looking at the dark side of this. But, but I, I've I've said to people, like, you you've got, you know the. The long march through the institutions is ready to take a victory lap at this point. Like, you know, it, it, there, it's not just a question of, okay, we need to vote Trump in to stop this stuff, or we, we need to vote DeSantis in to stop this stuff. It doesn't matter who you vote in. I mean, take a look at the ACLU. The ACLU is a shell of what it used to be. Indeed and, it is. You know, yeah. you know, take a look at other, the CDC, when the COVID vaccine came out, you know, it was in the New York Times that they were going to, they were looking at a recommendation to give out the vaccine based on race, not on like, who it affected. Um, and then with the next day, they, they withdrew that. Just You can go back and check this. It was New York Times for one day, went, like, just as the vaccine was about to come out. The CDC put that And the next day, they walked it back. Um, it, you know, then you have doctors who are now taking diversity oaths that kind of supersede the Hippocratic. I mean, it's, you know, th there's huge problems here. There's a lot of things that need to be fixed. And my, like I said, this, this got out of the university. And this is where, like, I've spoken to, you know, quite a few professors, friendly with, um, the heads were buried in the sand. I'm sorry, like, you, you had this stuff, like, you had the intersectionality start. Like, I know, I can, you can go back to postmodernism and the, the critical theory and all that um but like the intersectional lens when that started coming out and when courses were taught with that lens that's when things really like went sideways and those phds and master's students started coming out in about you know around 97 98 somewhere around there and that's when they started coming mm -hmm. out. now i'm saying like there's all these institutions are looking for you know sociology graduates or English graduates or history graduates like you know, think tanks whatever they're, they're looking for people with certain and unfortunately if you look at the humanities look at how you know like all these studies that have come out like how far they skewed one way that my thing is it's we've got a huge problem on our hands it's not a question of who you vote in or even if Harvard's got this academic freedom council now that they're going to look at things and like there's so much that needs to be fixed. Yes, it has, you have to start somewhere, and there's some you know you need to put a stop to the advance. But I see a lot of sorry, I'm rambling here, but I see a lot of uh, George W. Bush going to Iraq saying mission accomplished. Like a, 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 a an article comes out in the New York Times that's opposed to the gender ideology or the the you know the, the CRT version or the anti-racist version of you know fighting racism. Um, mm -hmm. And everyone's like, oh, see, it's, 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 you know, we've reached peak woke. No, no, you haven't. You've, yeah, come no, close we, to we, it. Uh, we, we, we don't know when peak woke is. <laughs> I, I think, uh, you know, yes, it's discouraging. I mean, well, first of all, let me say, uh, voting Trump in as a Bernie Sanders Democrat is not something I would regard as a solution. Um, yeah. No, no, I, I, I'm just throwing it out there. You know, I'm not yeah. saying it. You know. Yeah, uh, but uh, of course, of course, it's discouraging that so many people in academia, well, the humanities, as you say, they're recreating themselves. Of course, this is where you know some kind of resistance comes in and there are some of us you know you 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 interviewed cody for example mm -hmm. uh, he's a friend of mine who started uh, cfaf we're a little group we don't have much influence but the point is we're beginning to connect with other people who think in the same way academic freedom committees such as the one i'm chairing can have an influence too we're now uh <clears throat> We're now reviewing uh, these DHR procedures and so on. 
sitting in the same room across from me is the head of the uh, the um, bias response team. So I imagine we're going to have some pretty strong clashes pretty soon. But, you know, this is what happens. Resistance always starts small. But we don't know how many people there are out there who agree with us, who may agree with us. It's hard to say. You know, people do these surveys, and we're planning on doing one ourselves at the SF State. And what usually comes out of these surveys is that people are kind of scared to speak their mind. Many, many people are scared to speak their mind. So you may hope that uh, as people start to speak up, this is the hope, and this is what I'm hoping, that as people begin to speak up, that more and more people will be encouraged to speak up and to say, no, this is a bad thing. Now, as you say, are things getting worse? Yes. I can speak for my own uh, department. We have a college dean who has decided to make our college anti-racist, the College of Science and Engineering. What does that mean? You know, of course, anti-racist doesn't mean against racism. It's it's a, it's an ideology. So what she wants to do is impose that ideology top down on everybody without any discussion or debate. So it comes out and she appoints a committee. They have a report. And what is in the report? What should we do to become an anti-racist college? Well, first of all, there's going to be indoctrination sessions for hiring committees and uh, you know, all sorts of things for uh, how we should uh, teach our classes. So indoctrination, said, and, and that's not all. There's going to be a required course for undergraduates called Ethics in Science. In principle, that could be a good course, but it depends on thought by, right? Uh, as taught by the people that they, would, that they would choose, I think it would be another form of indoctrination. Secondly, there's going to be, well, the, we've talked about it already. Uh, you must express loyalty to the anti-racist agenda in order to be hired or retained or get tenure or to get promoted. Third on her list is to encourage and train students to complain to the, uh, the secret police, by which I mean bias response teams and Title IX, if they hear anything they don't like. And fourth, this person has even hired a commissar. Well, she's called an assistant dean, not a commissar. But if you look at the definition of commissar, the, dif the dictionary definition, commissar is a Communist Party official responsible for political organization and education. My God, replace the word communist by anti-racist, and that's virtually a job description of this person she hired. So we're, we're facing this in the College of Science and Engineering, a highly ideologically committed uh, dean who seems to me in other respects a nice person, but she believes so much in the truth of what she believes that she believes it's ethical to impose her own political beliefs top down on everybody. And of course, that's happening in a lot of places. There's a lot of deans and administrators and whatnot who are exactly like that and doing things like that. So from this point of view, I agree with you. I, I don't see it peaking yet. But there is also resistance out there, I think. And of course, you have brave people like uh, John McWhorter and so on, who Adolf Reed, who speak up and, uh, and point out the absurdities of these things. You know, look, uh, I wouldn't I, give up hope yet. Look, I'm not writing anything off, and I'm not, you know, and I respect the people who are trying to fight back against it. And there are people I can point out to, like uh, uh, Professor George, but he's been pushing back against this stuff since the 90s. There's also someone like Randall Kennedy, who, Randall can, Kennedy, go back yeah. to the, you know, who can go back to the 90s and show his critiques of things like critical race. Theory. That's right. That, so... I have a lot of respect for that, but I, I'm trying to be realistic. And I'm also at the same point. Like, you know, it, it's a very uphill fight. And I see a lot of people who just, oh, yeah, it's, you know, it's not going to be long. And I, I go back to the, to the first political connect correctness nonsense back in the late 80s, early 90s. You know, and when that finally died down, everyone's like, see, oh, and that came out of the postmodernism. Right? 
and everyone's like, oh, see, it's the nonsense has gone away. It was just a fad, no big deal. But yeah, no, it didn't really go away. It just, you know, it was, you stopped hearing about it in the early 90s, and then right around 2010, 2000, between 2010, 2012, it started leaking out of the academy again, and it was a lot worse because it just went inside, it hid, and it metastasized. And it just, and I'm, you know, it, again, like that's where I mean, the academy did not. People who would lecture you and they would use that, um, that quote, you know, like first they came for the trade unionists, and I said nothing because I was in the trade unionists. These people buried their heads in their sands, in the sand, while you know other people at that university, other professors, maybe not their department, other departments were being hunted by, as Jonathan Rout called them, kindly inquisitors, and they were being hunted by them. They lost jobs, they lost their freedom of expression. I mean, coming up to now, and like if you look at Fire's recent. Um, you know, free speech standings. Like even the best university on free speech is, you know, is average. <laughs> they're they're not, you know, they're like I think they're in the sixties, if I remember something like that. So it's it's not like uh, it's uh, fantastic or anything. Harvard rated as abysmal. Oh yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, does that really surprise you? I guess not. But you know, here here we have the premier educational institution in the world, Harvard. And and on free speech, they're rated as abysmal. My God, uh, it it shows uh, what control certain people, you know, certain in, well, certain sections of academia have had, and what success they've had in imposing their agenda. So again, you're but, right. Um, uh, but sorry, I just want to ask you this: Like, do you honestly still think Harvard's the premier educational center? I don't. I I, I think it's it's become so corrupted that. It's no longer providing a quality education. It's providing. Oh, okay. okay. You know, I would, uh, all right. Yeah. I would distinguish between education and research. Harvard and Princeton and uh, you know a few places, MIT, mm -hmm. which is also abysmal in free speech terms. As far as education, I don't know. As far as research, the, these guys are at the top. There's no question about it. But. Um, Education. Okay, I, I, I don't know that end of it, so I'll, you know, I, I, at least that's good to hear on that aspect. Yeah, but as I said before, you know, you can again. I'm a physicist, so I think from the top, from the point of view of science, uh, you can do great science under the worst conditions, and you can do it in uh, Soviet Russia. You could do it now in China. You can probably do it in North Korea. I mean, you know, you can always do good science even when the whole society around you is completely dysfunctional. So it might be something like that. Okay. Um, um, on that, so Soviet Union, right? So let's go back to the Cold War. They've got their physicists. I mean, you know, they launched Sputnik before the U.S. did anything to go, you know, moonshot or anything. Anything that's happening in the Soviet Union is kept inside the Soviet Union. Professors in the US, the UK, Canada, Australia, Germany, wherever, they publish a paper, they publish it, it goes out in the public. It's easy for anyone in the Soviets to grab that. So they could build off other people's science. Like if you, I'm not saying there weren't innovations, but they had access to all the other science. They couldn't collaborate with these people. They couldn't talk to them. They couldn't exchange. I'm sure there was... There were exchanges and there was, you know, people going back and forth a little bit, even, you know, the height of the Cold War. But no, there at were. the same point, it, it, it wasn't like at the same university or in the same state or something like that, where you can, you know, collaborate a lot easier or at least communicate a lot easier. Um, but you, you at least still have that access. But now if the universities in the West become so corrupt, see, like this is one of my greater concerns around if the universities in especially the anglosphere of the west become so corrupt that they are no longer providing a valuable education like how will, you know what's the runoff for that affecting the research right there is like, there is okay i mean you've got kids now coming into universities and i'm not okay again I, this is anecdotal i'm reading go you know, reports of this i'm not saying this is endemic or anything like that when i look at the math scores of kids coming out of high school you know, and in some districts, it was like 0% were proficient 
in mm-hmm. math when they're mm-hmm. graduating and these people are coming into STEM fields and they can't do algebra, like, you know, there's, there's huge problems coming up. So my thing is, like, if during the Soviet era, the American education system became like this, would there have been anything for the Soviets to steal off of? They would have had to open up a little bit and try to get some information because the Amer- like there was nothing good coming out of the Americans. I mean, like, so I look at like the Middle East and I look at places like India or like I talk about South Africa. We're exporting these ideas. So in the Middle East, um, it just I there because I have friends who do work out there and I have friends who have like nonprofits that do work out there. Um, so post colonialism. Uh, is used quite a bit. I mean, they use the the, the, the CRT anti-racist stuff as well, but it's more post-colonialism. And so when, when someone tries to talk about Enlightenment values, it's like, oh, no, no, that's just Westernism. That's just another form of colonialism. Keep it out. Okay. Uh, I've even heard, this is not with the Middle East, but when the protests were going on in Hong Kong around 2019, there were quote-unquote serious people who said, no, 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 because these, these kids were holding the Union Jacks and the, the American flag, and were these people that said, no, 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 democracy is another form of colonialism. Communism would be better for them. It's better if they live under the CCP because they, then they wouldn't be colonized. And it, th- these were like serious comments. New York Times did, a, did an op-ed on them. Uh, but yeah, so like, like that's what I'm saying. Like it's the effects this is having in other parts of the world because Harvard is the premier school in the world or you go to Yale or Princeton or Stanford or MIT or, you know, Notre Dame. Duke or any of these like big schools and you go back and you take this back to those countries. India, transgenderism right now is spreading so fast that women are losing rights before they can even get them because, you know, trans women are women. Um, in, like I said, in the Middle East, it's post-colonialism. In South Africa and parts of Africa, you've got the anti-racism stuff. And you've also got some of the post-colonial stuff, like I don't want to that out, but they've also got that as well in there. Um, so these ideas are spreading. You know, we're dumbing ourselves down. We're dumbing down the rest of the world. And I'm like, my whole thing is like that whole greater thing. Like, yeah, you could have done science in the Soviet Union, but if you didn't have free science somewhere else for them to look at, how far would they have gotten? And so you need that exchange of ideas happening. And if we atrophy, what ideas are we exchanging at that point? Well, you know, I, I think, first of all, in the Soviet Union, they didn't steal anything. The point is that, that scientific literature, they published and we published. So even if only a few of them could uh, could go to the West, I remember in the, uh, when was it, the 1980s, uh, the Eastern Europeans would have conferences somewhere in Slovakia, and some of us from the West would come and meet them because they couldn't go to the West. But everybody had access to the same journals. They published, we published. There was plenty of interchange there. Um, what worries me basically is this about, you know, if we talk future of science. The main problem is that uh, advancement due to merit is regarded as racist. That's the real problem. There was a brilliant article written not long ago. It was called On Defense of Merit in Science. And essentially it was making these points that if you want to have, you know, if we're going to be, uh, to continue to be leaders in science, then you select people, you know, for graduate school, for postdocs, for faculty. You select people on the basis of their merit in science, not their skin color and not their ideology. Now this, of course, is anathema to anti-racist social justice people. They will argue that, well, you know, there's this issue of equity and, uh, you know, we have to be equitable and uh, you can't judge people the same and so on uh, because they come from varying backgrounds. Perhaps they've been disadvantaged. And there's some truth to that, of course. Uh, I think, for example, that uh, when it comes to college admissions, I would take you know, account of the fact that uh, perhaps someone came from a very bad neighborhood, went to a very bad school, but did rather well despite those disadvantages. That's something I would take into account. But, you know, that has to do with social class. 
you know, it's not like there are no white kids that, uh, the, like every white kid comes from, you know, a, a wealthy upper middle class family. It's not true. Same with Asians, same with Hispanics. So if you said, I'm going to maybe give some advantage in the college admissions race to people who have shown that they can overcome adversity and so on, that's fine. When, it come, when you get to a higher level, when you get to selecting people for graduate school and for postdoctoral positions and for faculty positions, then I think skin color and ideology should be irrelevant. It really should, because if you start selecting for ideology, you're going to get mediocre scientists and mediocre science. The Soviet Union didn't do that. Well, they did it to some extent. That's not completely true. But, you know, if you kept your head down and shut up, you could do good science in the Soviet Union, and they did. Of course, I should say, they're... Um, well, there were, there were exceptions. For example, the Soviets had brilliant mathematicians, wonderful, probably the best in the world. However, they also systematically, at some period in their history, they, uh, they excluded Jewish kids from, uh, from their best universities. So they had garbage like that going around. Nevertheless, despite that, they were, uh, they were pretty good at mathematics because from the rest of the pool, they picked the best. So I agree with you. I mean, if if we if we select according to criteria other than merit, we're going to fall way behind. We're going to fall way behind, and that's a realistic possibility. I think. I don't think it's yet, but it, it could be on the horizon. Yeah, and I mean, like I said, it's. But now you've got to look at it from top to bottom or bottom to you know, from the bottom up primary schools and secondary schools aren't preparing the kids for college bachelor is going to be five years now six years like, I mean, like you, you need that extra time because it, it's not just math right? it's also um english like it's something like 75 percent of the kids aren't proficient you know uh, at a reading level uh at, or aren't reading at grade level by the time they graduate so mm -hmm. again, you have kids who can't read and write properly. So, I mean, I realize STEM doesn't you know value creative writing that much, but you need to be able to know how to write a paper. You know, if you get it, if you get advanced, you need to know how to write a proposal. You need to have, you, know, you need to be able to communicate. It's you know, so you need all these skills. So it's by going down that route, you're paying a huge. You're, I mean, you're doing a huge disservice to. I mean, first of all, to the communities you say you want to help. But you're not. You're helping the rich, first of all. It doesn't matter how bad the schools get; they're going to get their tutors, and they're going to get their private, like you know, not, not even private school, like private you know, schools, but they're going to get their private tutors, and they're going to get separate instruction for their kids, and their kids are going to get all the advantages they can, and they'll advance. Mm -hmm. and, but you know, you won't get a Glenn Lowry, who was a poor kid out of Chicago, or a Thomas Sowell. You yeah. won't get that. Yeah. And it's, you know, so it's, that's what I mean. Like, we're, it, I'm like, yes, it's great that there's academics fighting back with this. And I, I hope it succeeds. I hope universities can pull back. Or maybe there needs to be more things like the University of Austin. Um, you know, there was the other one too, the Ralston Academy, uh, which did something similar, I believe. And, you know, and I mean, I hate to say this. I spoke to Cody about this, that. I think you're at a point now where you need some government intervention and, and that's going to have to be carefully done because otherwise you're going to have an overcorrection and it's just, you know, you, I don't want to go the other way either. And yeah, yeah. This, this is a point Cody and I disagree on. Uh, we've talked mm -hmm. about it. I, I worry about government intervention. I really do. I, I feel that somehow we have to try and come from within those of us who are in academia well, not just that. Uh, you were talking. Let, let's let's go back to K twelve for a moment. Uh, here in San Francisco, uh, we had this horrible school board, um, and one of the things that they wanted to do, which in fact they did for a while, we we have a uh, you know we have a very selective high school by the name of Lowell. 
And to get into Lowell, you have to have good grades and you have to have letters from your teacher and test scores and whatnot. So that's our elite school. Other cities have them too, you know, Stuyvesant or Bronx High School of Science in New York and similar things in other places. Well, our school board decided that this was racist. So what they did instead, they made it um, a lottery. Okay, just lottery. It doesn't matter how you did in school. Of course, had that lasted, uh, Lowell would no longer be Lowell. It would just be a regular high school. So they would essentially destroy Lowell in order to make it uh, compatible with their philosophy. Another thing this crazy school board tried to do was to rename all our schools. Take Lowell was an example. Lowell was a poet and he was an abolitionist, but apparently he said one or two things that didn't sound too good, so they wanted to take his name off, uh, off of that. Uh, Abraham Lincoln had to go. George Washington, oh my gosh, he had to go. He owned slaves after all. And so on. And even Paul Revere, now this is one of the funny ones. We had some middle school named after Paul Revere. So the, uh, the, the, these, um, the school board said, well, Paul Revere led a raid on some Indian tribe by some name that I forget, and therefore he sh his name shouldn't be there either. It turned out they got their history wrong. Paul Revere led a raid all right in some village by this long name, but it was a raid on the British. When this was pointed out, they didn't care. They just, you know, they just doubled down. Okay, now the point <laughs> is that uh, the public got fed up with this. And uh, in particular, the, uh, the Asian community, which is very large in San Francisco, got fed up with it because they always saw Lowell as a stepping stone, you know, you, they're not rich. Many, well, some are, of course, but, you know, many Asians aren't. And this ties in with, a, with the um, point you just made, that these things, these kinds of things are not helping underprivileged communities. They're hurting them. Because how does a black kid, let's say, who comes out of one of our worst schools, how does this kid get to prove that uh, hey, you know, I've got talent. I can do it. Well, that's what Lowell was intended to do. You know, if you did really well, even in this bad school, if you got really good grades at that bad school, if you did well on tests, if you had good letters, you could go to Lowell. Okay? But what is this talented student, this Thomas Lowell or uh, Glenn Lowry, what do they do if they don't have that? Now there's no lottery. So they go to some other crummy school and they don't become Glenn Lowry and they don't become Thomas Sowell. These kinds of policies are destructive, destructive to the minority communities that they're supposed to help. So I think people saw that and uh, happily we booted those guys out. They're no longer on the school board. So yeah. there are things that can be done through the electoral process too. I mean, like I... I don't want to see government intervention, but the one thing I've been saying and I've been kind of like leaning towards this for a while now. Um, so there's the, the the play of man for all seasons. So the the English, um, you know, the Church yep. of England Inquisitor Roper, mm -hmm. Thomas More asked him like you, you know uh, Thomas More, wasn't it? Yeah, Thomas More asked Roper, like, you know, you'd burn down the law to catch the devil. And Roper said, yep, I'd burn down every law in England if I could catch the devil. So, yeah, you're the, just the person to do it. But what are you going to do when the devil turns around and faces you? You know, you've burned down the whole law. You've got nothing left to defend you. So this, whatever critical social justice left, far left, whatever you want to call them, you know, woke, I don't care about the name, um, the, the, this, this whole thing. Like you talked about intersectionality, like being opposed to the Enlightenment. Yeah, I mean, Crenshaw wrote in Mapping the Margins at the very end of it that we need to get away from the liberal ethic and we need to have an a politics of identity. They, they want to get rid of civil rights. They want to get rid of all like they, they despise the Enlightenment. So, yes. um, so yeah, like I mean, the sorry, I'm just getting I, I just get flustered here. Like, the, like I can't believe that. Sorry, I just completely lost my train of thought. So I'm just going to drop that there. 
Yeah, no, like it's just, like I said, it's, it's sanity. Like you know, it's, it's, no, I see. What, I see where you're going. What you're saying is that things are at such a desperate point, and this is the point what I've discussed also with Cody. That things could get so bad that uh, the government should step in. In my discussions with Cody, he 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 pushed me to this point. He said, "Well, look, uh, suppose you had." a uh, biology department which was taken over by creationists and uh, you know they would just hire other creationists and so on do you think that the government shouldn't step in at that point and i had to concede the point yes i would i don't think that uh, you know you should have creationists running a well they can believe anything they like they can believe in a talking snake snake i don't care but um you know, if they're not teaching the theory of evolution, they shouldn't be, you know, in a biology department. Okay, so I concede that point. What I worry about is because, and, and why? Because uh, science is a little bit different from the humanities. In science, we can really say this, you know, we have very, very good evidence that this is true. Of course, in science, we can never be sure about anything. Yeah. But we can be pretty sure. Humanities is a lot different. And uh, I, I have problems with, um, much as I dislike critical theory, I would be very hesitant to have the government getting in and on it and saying that, you know, these schools, schools can't teach critical theory. That, that's And that's what DeSantis is doing, as I understand it. And, and that... Uh, that's a step too far for me. Yeah. Okay. Look, the the, the stop woke law. Um. Again, the best people. I, for things like that, I kind of look to fire because I find that they're like completely as unbiased as you can be on the whole topic of free speech. And you know, if they put something out, I'll read it. And you know, even if I re- disagree with it, at least you know, I give their. Um, their ideas a lot of consideration um but yeah so but there's some parts of it that i agree with and there are some parts of it that i disagree with that's why I'm, like, I'm worried about what happens when the government goes in there's, there, i mean there's always going to be concept creep there's always going to be some sort of overreach and i don't want these overcorrections. i don't want you know, Going back to K through twelve stuff in Texas, they put out some laws, and I know the K through twelve argument is different because it's is it age appropriate? They're, they're curating the, the the books, like the curriculum, like they've always done, and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but so they pulled. Uh, so Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay wrote the book Cynical Theories, where they walk through the history of this stuff. They pulled that, and they said that was promoting CRT. I'm like, well, no, it isn't. It's an over like that. That's an overcorrection because in their in their urge to get out anything with CRT, that was one of the books they pulled. Right? Because sorry, they who, didn't know. Who, who pulled the Pluck Rose Taylor book? It was called Cynical uh, Theories, I think. Yeah, what? yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they was, it, was the, it was in Texas. The, they pulled the that from the libraries, or, or what did they do? They dropped it from the curriculum. They said it's not an acceptable book oh. from the curriculum because it talks about critical race theory. I see, I see, yeah. So, so I mean, the, this was at K 12 or university level? K, K through 12. Uh-huh. So I mean, like that's what I'm saying. Like, there's overcorrections like that. I don't want to see it happen, but I'm just worried that it's gone so far in the other direction that if you don't have that, like, okay, again, I don't think any, you know, teach critical race theory, teach gender studies, teach whatever you want, teach alchemy for all I care. But the alchemy department can't tell the chemistry department how to run, how to work, and. I mean, honestly, if, if I'd like it if the university said, you know what, like, okay, like, like BU right now, the Kennedy Center is being shut down. Like, you know, I, I, great. I think that's awesome. Um, but, like, on the other hand, like, you know, University of Chicago is, has a chair of CRT now. I think mm. CRT and gender studies, whatever you want to study it, go ahead and study it. But these are non credit courses. It's up to you to study it. It's, all, it's your own, you know, you can take extra courses if you want. We study this stuff, but we won't give you credit for it. Like I'm, I'm sorry, Kendi's PhD devalues PhDs. Mm-hmm. You know, and then again, I get back to how how much how many people in certain jobs doing certain things right now do that. And if you get rid of them, what are they going to do? Because what is someone 
the gender studies degree you're going to do if they're not working in HR or back in the academy or in the government. Like, like, like honestly, I don't think Starbucks has enough locations for that many baristas. <laughs> but it, it, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, you know, I, I had this feeling that uh, you know, I, I haven't been involved in political stuff since I was a student far back into the 60s. I got involved in it because I suddenly discovered uh, that they were you know, suddenly indoctrinating us in stuff I had never heard of, you know, Ibram Kendi, who the hell is that? And the, I was aware that Africana studies, say, was teaching some crazy things. Uh, but it didn't bother me, you know, because they weren't impacting me or at that time anybody else. You know, if somebody wants to go off and take a degree in gender studies or Africana studies and get a BS in it, well named uh go ahead okay it, it doesn't bother me it doesn't bother anybody who's getting a, a degree in real studies but um the problem is as you say that uh, somehow or other these guys have insinuated themselves into the administration of colleges and universities and are imposing their views on everyone else that's the problem that's the problem so now in the college, as I just said in detail, in the College of Science and Engineering, we're now supposed to become an anti-racist, quote unquote, anti-racist college. And we have these um, mechanisms for prosecuting speech. And all of this is, is coming from the kind of uh, studies that you're talking about, CRT and uh, critical theory, blah, blah, blah. The question is, what do we do about it? And uh, what you're proposing is that the solution should come from the government in some way, like DeSantis, you know, forbidding CRT in the universities. Oh, um, I worry, uh, I worry uh, about uh, that. Uh, as a, uh, 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 sorry, sorry, I'm going to, because I, I, what DeSantis said about not teaching CRT, I close it. Like I said, you can teach CRT, but I think the universities themselves if they want to be serious about this, and I'm not, no one should force the universities, no one should, but I think if the university wants to be serious about going after academic freedom, A, these people, like, if you want us to use your theories to run our administration, how we run our university, prove your stuff, because, you know, if you're saying this is a white supremacist system, show it to us, show us your proof. If you mm -hmm. can't, sorry, you're done out of our administration. And like I said, make, you're allowed to teach them, you're allowed to take them, but these don't count for credit. I'm just, if you can't show the value in those in those things, like I, I don't think it should be allowed to. Like it, the same reason, like I said, if you want to teach alchemy, teach alchemy, but I don't think they should give up PhDs in alchemy. Like I honestly don't. It's, well, it's with alchemy, idea. it's it, with alchemy is a different story again because it's a scientific issue. With with scientific issues, you can say, look, uh, you're not going to turn lead into gold unless you have a very very large particle accelerator. Um, so al alchemy is easy to deal with. With humanities, it's much more difficult to deal with yeah. uh, it, it, because, you know, true and false becomes much, much harder. It's, it's much harder. You know, these guys can say, look, you know, what we're doing is uh, teaching the true history of, uh, you know, true history of the country, blah, blah, blah. And I find it worrisome. If a government would decide to step in and say, well, no, you can't teach it that way or you can't teach it for credit or whatnot, it worries me for the reasons you've already suggested. Overreach. Overreach <laughs> when you do something like that is, is almost inevitable. It's usually mm -hmm. done by people with a rather right-wing point of view, and they're going to overreach, necessarily overreach. So I would be, I would be very scared of trying to deal with the problem that way. Now my hope is that uh, you know these little networks here and there, people waking up a little bit to what's going on, that we can eventually grow, and we can eventually try to purge administrations 
uh, people who are applying these nutty theories to suppress other people's opinions and other people's right of speech. I want to see it come from within the within the academia. If it doesn't, if there's no chance of that, well, we'll talk again in 10 years. But uh, I, I first would give the resistance a chance. I think there will be a resistance. I think these things, I hope it will peak. I hope it will peak. Maybe it will. Let's give it a um, chance. Oh, I think that's a good place to end. It's also, I realize we've gone a bit of a I don't want to take up too much of your time, but uh, yeah, no, that's a good place to stop. But I, I, okay, look, I hope it does too. I hope that this can happen organically from from inside the universities. I like the government involvement is for me. It's the last, you know, it's the hail mary. It's something you need, and I, I unfortunately think we're maybe at that point. But I'm an outsider looking in. So I'll, I'll respect your judgment of someone who's actually inside the academy and you're you know trying to put a stop to it. Like, oh, you know, you have information that I don't, so I'll respect that. But like I said, that what my gut feeling is that we're it, it's too far gone and we're gonna need something. But it's honestly to me, it's always that's been a hail mary. It's like I don't want to go down that road, but I you know, you're saying okay, we'll see you in ten years. For me, this is yeah, that's it. But like I said, I I, I like. What you're saying like it's, it could be happening and I, I do know there's a lot of different things going on um i know that you know uh there's what what you're doing at the california state system uh, you know harvard's doing something like that uh, princeton also just started something um uh, someone else i know Lee justin he's a professor of psychology at rutgers him and a few others are doing something where they're basically just calling out all the fallacies and stuff there, there's things like that there's a lot of pushback and you know, people like the so, and a lot can be done at the K-12 level. It's easier yeah. at the K-12 level because you can insist, yes, we should treat, we should teach the true history of the United States. Nobody's denying that. But the true history of the United States also includes the good things, the Bill of Rights, democracy, yeah. you know, things like that. Yeah. Let's not uh, let's not undervalue that. And that's yeah. something which can be dealt with at the state level because K-12 is is um, is ultimately determined at the, at the uh, state level. Well, anyways, like I said, let's uh, end on that. So thank you very much, Jeff. It was great talking to you. It was uh, a lot of fun. Thanks very thanks much. Lot, everyone. And thanks a lot, everyone else. I'll be back.